Welcome back to another smooth episode of Uncle Jay's Lounge. This uh, podcast is about giving you value, making sure that you have the best podcast experience ever. And I do this with my co-host, Julian. How's it going, my man? You know, that's right. You know, I'm ready to crush it. I'm ready to talk a little bit of space, a little bit of VR, get the brain going. Some topics that I think are are very exciting and uh, I'm looking forward to it, my man. I... I am too. I think this one is going to be really amazing because we get to talk about some of the deepest, nerdiest stuff we got going on right now. And that is civilians in space and artificial, well, not artificial intelligence, but augmented reality on battlefields. So it's very video game-esque subjects that we have going on here today. How much would I have to pay you to go to space? Zero. I'll, I would consider paying you if that's so- the offer. So you do it right now. If someone just came into your your home and said, "Hey, Jordan, we're going to space," you do it today. Um, well, it depends on where, how, and how long. I would say because space is pretty big. You know, am I coming back? Yeah, you're just doing a simple orbit around the moon, couple days, and then you're back on Earth. Well, you know, I know that I have my own personal price, but. I also know that somebody's willing to fork up a hundred million dollars of their own money to get up on that space station or spaceship, actually, which is crazy, man. Would you say that that's the appropriate amount of money for you to get up in there? I think there's such a small percentage of people that have been to space that it is a historic moment, especially in what Inspiration4 is doing with their civilian space crew that it may, in the grand scheme of things, etch your name into some sort of history book. You've given a little bit to charity, and you have that out-of-earth experience that little to no one in the current time will ever experience until you know technology scales way down the road if space exploration becomes more of a consumer or civilian travel case. It, it's interesting that you think that is how it's going to become or it's going to scale so much that it's almost like airplanes where at first airplanes were only for the exuberantly rich but now you know it's it's for everybody it's almost been pushed down because of capitalism and i think the same thing with space travel and hopefully it'll happen during our lifetime but i think it's also kind of funny that the founder and ceo of shift four payments is the guy that's forking up a lot of cash and it happens to be now that this thing is called inspiration for. So I'm thinking that he had his hands at a lot of things with that green, man. For sure. But at the end of the day, I, it's crazy to me that they're going to, it's a civilian space mission. I don't, to the best of my knowledge, right? That is a big step to be the first civilian space mission crowd going into space because you think about astronauts and how rigorously trained and educated they are in their fields and understanding everything that's going on then putting civilians in there and then customizing a rocket ship or a spaceship for space exploration and travel and all the different factors that go into that and potentially you know insurance and families and everything it's a pretty big jump very quickly considering we've never really necessarily been back to the moon or on the moon and so just to orbit around it obviously we've done but with from a civilian point of view it's it's really cool yeah very much so and i think that it's it shows the capability of technology to handle a lot of these really really complex calculations and moves and the fact that you can have a data analyst, a healthcare worker, a CEO, and a professor man a space station and kind of make that trip safely, even. So it's it's all in the computers now. And I feel like that just is a huge highlight or illustration of it's really close to being scalable to everybody, regardless of skill set or knowledge. I agree. It's also... Now that we talk about it, I think about you look at SpaceX as a private space exploration company. It's not even NASA. Like SpaceX has come into the space relatively recently and is already jumping leaps and bounds to try out and give these opportunities to individuals from all different fields, as you pointed at. I wonder, out of these four candidates, 
who do you think is going to have the the most profound experience or who do you think is going to really enjoy the experience more than the others? I know it's a tough question, but who would you think is going to enjoy it a little bit more? So I think that there's a few people. There is a guy who is uh, a vet, a U.S. vet, and he did aerospace. Um, he was employed in the aerospace industry and the U.S. Air Force. And so I think that he might be an interesting pick. But also the professor that I mentioned earlier is actually a professor of, um, you know, space itself. And so I think that that might be the person that would be the most hyped um, to kind of pop on. And, you know, I think that college, a college science professor would be the best, you know, embodiment of somebody nerding out for something like this trip. So uh, I would tip my hat to, to Proctor or Dr. Proctor. (laughs) <laughs> <I'm starting laughs> <to feel. laughs> sounds like a testing platform yeah yeah it does or it stops students from cheating <laughs> yeah yeah i think uh it seems like the the vet who has a little bit of a background you know might hop on to the ship and kind of uh, tony's gonna do a little demo <laughs> and maybe <laughs> maybe be very confident and i think all of them are going to enjoy it i think the really cool story out of here for me was um the physics assistant uh haley or physician's assistant haley who was like a childhood bone cancer survivor it's a pretty large jump from one end of the spectrum to the other from surviving you know childhood bone cancer to being one of the first individuals to go on a civilian space mission uh, quite the story there and who knows what's happened in between, but to just to be for any of them, I'm, I'm sure to be up in space and look back on the earth and not physically be on the earth is something that'll render most people utterly sp- speechless, especially if you're a flat earther. Oh yeah. 100%. I think, <laughs> well, I mean, in that case, then it will just, you know, prove or show to everybody that they were wrong and you were right that the earth is flat that would be great man like you know you just get the spokesman of the flat earth committee or whatever send him up there and then he has to break the news to everyone i think that that would be that would be worth it right there Uh, the thing that i wonder now is you know elon musk has been the leader of a lot of you know industries you know the auto industry with his electric cars Neuralink, so the biotech you know I think that's a like bioengineering and biotech stuff. And now we have space exploration. I, th- I always wonder about the people that are kind of chomping at his ankles. And I know that Richard Branson has been trying to do this for a long time now. So I'm really curious to see how far behind people are off the back of this trip that they're taking. Um, no. And you know, the timing's weird, right? They say no later than what, February 15th. So um, from there onwards, we'll see this operation take place. It is a big risk, though, if this goes sideways, like the Challenger flight. Obviously, that was astronauts. But if the civilian flight goes sideways, it is a, a big risk, big reward type proposition that SpaceX is offering here. If it goes well, that's great for the company. If it goes wrong, then that's a, a potential very big hit for um, you know, who those who may be investing in the company or shareholders or, you know, the outlook for that space for the the near to moderate future. Absolutely. It is it's a, obviously a huge, huge case study on if this thing is possible, especially with people who are not astronauts who are doing this. So just kind of ratchet up the difficulty of execution a whole lot more as well. So I'm really, really interested to to see how that goes. And I think the valuation of the whole entire industry is going to be flooded with value uh, off of this example. I mean, who is not going to kind of want to lean into this knowing that it is possible to send civilians up there for something that what we're talking about a total of less than what a hundred people since 1969 nice have done <laughs> thought you'd like that oh <laughs> um <laughs> and so 
you know, SpaceX comes into Uncle Jay's mansion and says, all right, Uncle Jay's hop onto the hop onto uh, the SpaceX crew dragon. And uh, we're going to give you one song to play for liftoff. What is the song that you are playing that is being nationally televised across the globe for the liftoff of the civilian space mission? Well, obviously, we'd talk about this as a group. But if you were sick that day, let's say, I would say Can't Stop Me by Queen. Oh, that's a, can't that's stop a me good now. one. Yeah, I love yeah. it. I'd love that one. Um, how about you, Julian? Uh, you know, it's a real, real tough one. I think if I was going to space and I wanted to set a, a positive mood, I'd probably do the classic Sir Duke by Stevie Wonder. I think that's a that's a good solid mm. choice for my my liftoff song. I would say. You know what, man? I'm gonna take this back. I want this podcast to be going as the rocket lifts off. Shameless plug, to be honest. It wouldn't be my first choice, but as far as like a as a salesman and somebody who thinks that this podcast is great, I think that it's an excellent choice. <laughs> Could you imagine a podcast in space? I'm not. I'm surprised NASA isn't already working on that from the International Space Station. But just podcasting around, you're going around the globe or around the moon, and you're just kind of looking at this. In this mission for Inspiration Four, they have like an observation window built especially for this mission. But just looking out the window and going, oh, looks like there's uh, some thunderstorms happening below on Earth out here in space. Still pretty dark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people start doing weather <laughs> from space. <laughs> you know, I think that technically, couldn't you just uh, remaster the conversations that the astronauts are having with uh, ground control and then consider that a podcast itself? I mean, maybe they're not talking about anything interesting, but I know that there's been yeah. interviews from space before. Yeah, you most definitely could unless those those get a little spicy, but... I think especially if not maybe for this mission, but for long term missions where people are doing 30, 60, 100 days in space, then maybe some of those findings for more of the technically advanced and specialized astronauts could be interesting just to hear about their day to day or some things that they observed. You know, it may not be appealing to the everyday listener, but that science community, the astronomy community would definitely love to hear that yeah yeah and i i think that general you know in general people have just a strong and healthy fascination and curiosity for space so i really think that there's a huge audience for this i agree spacex nasa if you need uh, some podcast hosts to interview these astronauts uh you know we may be willing for the right price to to do so but uh, for the time being you know, we'll be looking forward to sometime after September 15th of this expected launch date for Inspiration 4. Uh, we'll look forward to Jared, Haley, Dr. Proctor, and Chris's exploration up and around the moon. And also, I'll be waiting for the coupon day to do it for 50% <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah yeah nice send it on a groupon or even do some direct to mail mailers uh, we'll definitely <laughs> yeah. take you up on those i think that this is a perfect you know segue to uh you know talking about deals the the talk of town is essentially that microsoft did one of the most massive deals ever with the u.s army 21.9 billion dollars over 10 years to win an U.S. Army contract for augmented reality headsets. A, a huge jump for the U.S. Army in terms of what AR can do for the armed forces. It's huge. The application is so widespread because not only do you have, you know, night vision, thermal vision, things of that nature, but you also have the possibility of seeing bullet trajectory and also obviously telling civilian from. Uh, target. So I think that there's, it's it's going to be quite an interesting application of technology. And I think that this is like such, such a COD-esque storyline that we have here. 
That's spot on. For those who don't know the difference between VR and AR, VR is think of an Oculus Rift or a device that you put over your eyes and virtually puts you into an environment uh, with different sensory things going on. So you could virtually be driving an F1 racing car or in the court side at an NBA game. AR, as Jordan said, think if you've played video games like Call of Duty or maybe think of Google Glass where these pieces of information are popping up onto the lens of your glasses where you're still seeing your reality, your day to day, but maybe in the top left, it's showing email notifications or in the bottom right, it's showing, you know, distance to your location, things that you can read whilst using this AR technology. And as you can see, that is going to be implemented into these augmented reality headsets for the U.S. Army. And I think there's actually some interesting dynamics here, especially with Microsoft themselves. Not only are they heading up this massive, obviously massive deal um, worth 20 plus billion dollars, but they've also won a contract with the Pentagon for cloud, like cloud development and support. And we also are hearing some blowback from the actual employees of Microsoft saying, hey, we don't want to support, you know, something like the U.S. Army, knowing that our technology is going to aid them in killing people, essentially. And what do you think about that? You know, I think this is where it's in quite an interesting dynamic between the power, you know, between a corporation and its people working in there. Do you find, do you think that there's going to be any leeway or pull that these employees have, even if they leave, which is probably the biggest thing they can do? Um, at this point, I, I don't know if there's going to be a big chain. The contract's been signed uh, and you never know which employees are voicing which opinions. And I understand the sentiment if you are anti-war or you don't want to aid in violence or you didn't originally create this technology for this purpose. However, I think at this point with the prototypes they have, this this test trial is really going to be the big push and it's going to overall with military and U.S. government funding going to help augmented reality as a whole by leaps and bounds as the success comes in. Investors are more willing to invest in AR startups. You can see how the technology is integrated, and then you can start utilizing that for more consumer-based goods and bringing out those more day-to-day augmented reality that they may have been hoping for, where on your windshield of your car, you can see directions or weather or, you know, information coming up on there as showed in, you know, prototype car ads, things like that. So I think military investment is a big bonus if goes well for the augmented reality industry. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. We've seen this time and time again, where military innovation leads to public consumption of those things and you know improves lives of us as the populace of themselves so i think that that's absolutely going to be the case it it will be interesting to see how this actually interplays and in, you know the actual adoption of this stuff and how it is actually used cuz we know some use cases but i'm sure with some time and creativity you can find tons of ways how augmented reality can really benefit and dare I say augment the application in the arm of the army. The one thing you touched on earlier that I think is the wildest thing out of this article that came out is that this system could, emphasis on could, show the aim for a weapon, which seems so bizarre and wild to what the firearm industry has been in the past to where you're looking through this headset and it's showing you where your aim is located and where it may or may not land. Yeah, it's, it's a huge thing. And of course they have ballistics computers and tools to help them aim and adjust for like long distance shooting, but this can also help them with, discerning you know blue on blue which is a thing that if you know what blue on blue is or if you don't a quick explanation of it is essentially um, people of the same unit or organization firing upon each other so 
this can actually help in a lot of ways, whether it be accuracy. So, you know, if there's just happens to be somebody that is just unlucky and gets hit by a just stray bullet, maybe that can turn down the occurrences of that. And also people who are, you know, the bullet hits the target, but the target is actually somebody you would not want to be shooting. That's a, that's a great point. And it also works in the area of thermal imaging, potentially, where you can see heat signatures, which they have technology to do so, but every army member could, through their headset, see these heat signatures that haven't been targeted as friendly and potentially read and analyze the situation of you know what corner it may or may not be around, how many individuals are in a certain shelter or home or building to make those type of decisions where it, as we talk about it more and more, it does just sound a lot like video games from, you know, starting in 2010 when they're implementing these types of fun theories into their games. It's so interesting to be able to witness how imagination becomes reality. And I think that this is a perfect example of there's things that we've played on video games that we think, oh, wow, wouldn't that be crazy? But now we get to see those things. And imagine if it is the, the actual like thing of you can actually see how many bullets you have left in your magazine and you know when you'll need to reload and things of that nature where it gets more and more like a video game and kind of uh, a little bit torn away from reality itself. And I'm not exactly sure how I feel about it, but it's really interesting to think about the implications it'll have on war itself. It's interesting too how far AR has come. When you look at one of the first AR devices which failed in the consumer eyes but excelled in the medical field was Google Glass, where that came out quite a bit early as a prototype and Google tried to push, just wasn't ready for everyday life. And turns out a lot of nurses in various hospitals are using Google Glass for more information. And so I'm curious to see where once the data comes in from this utilization by the U.S. Army, where this trickles down into that consumer product and how it benefits society and what it may you know, bring to the table that doesn't already currently exist. Yeah, there's it's well, yeah, I think that there's so many routes that this could possibly have to change the future, especially with the the acceleration of this technology that we can see as far as its application in the world. I'm I'm really looking forward to it, man. And I think, of course, it kind of gets a little bit interesting when it comes to, you know, army and military forces using technology. But I think that this one might actually not make a bigger, stronger stick, but a more precise tool or instrument for them to use. And then further on for us to use in different applications. For you as a consumer, where is one place you'd like to see AR be instituted to improve your day-to-day life? If I could have AR glasses that projected an image calculated by machine learning, of what that person's butthole looked like. And I have very seldom been at a loss for words. Sir, I just came But I don't even know what to ask you first. I guess that would, don't you think that'd be an invasion of privacy? No, who's privacy? (laughs) (laughs) Just imagine the the population of, you know, a, a major city, London, New York, Dubai, and everyone has these glasses and that's what everyone's, default measurement is yeah, buttholes for conference <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I, it's I, like I, a fingerprint <laughs> julian you can identify anybody with it <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah i uh you know i would like to just see in the same regards maybe glasses but just maybe for translation purposes maybe be able to travel abroad without worrying too much about a language barrier just to be able to read kind of signs uh, a bit more and have that translated to English. You know, there's actually, if you, if you have um, a Google plugin for your camera, you can actually do that right now. I did it when I was in Italy and it actually is hugely helpful. So I would check that out. 
Exactly. So instead of having it on my phone, I just can keep my phone in my pocket, rock with my glasses, and then, you know, filter through translations or, you know, reviews or however that pulled up. I mean, Google's definitely another pioneer in AR. So we'll see. I think this overall Google will learn a lot and the whole AR industry as a whole is going to potentially expand very rapidly with the success or inversely may shrink a bit more if this is deemed unsuccessful for the U.S. Army. I guess time will tell, but I hope that everybody had an, uh, you know, I hope that everyone got value out of this podcast. And if you did, there's tons of ways to interact with us um, or there's tons of ways not to. But the best way would be to reach out to us or at the very least, check out our next podcast or check out our previous podcast that we've already recorded. Exactly. Every Tuesday, Uncle Jay's Lounge giving it to you from just a normal perspective. Never experts, just breaking it down just as you would. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And like Uncle Jay said, we'll catch you next week. Peace.